Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on hydrocarbons and crude oil. Um, before you watch this video, make sure you're comfortable and confident with states of matter, um, covalent bonding, and separated mixtures. And I've got videos on all of those things earlier in this playlist. Now, in this video, we are going to cover what we mean by hydrocarbons and uh, what crude oil is. We'll look at how to separate crude oil into the different hydrocarbons it contains. We'll look at the uses and properties of the fractions of crude oil. Then we'll look at what we mean by the term homologous series. And finally, we'll look at what cracking is and why it's useful. OK, so we're going to start off by looking at what crude oil is and what hydrocarbons are. So hydrocarbons are compounds containing only hydrogen and carbon. And all four words there are important. It must be only hydrogen and carbon, but it must also be both hydrogen and carbon. It can't just be one or the other. So let's look at some examples. This first one here on the left, this is something called butane. We'll meet this in more detail later in this presentation. So um, this is butane and it's made out of hydrogen atoms. There's 10 of those and a whole load of carbon atoms. And importantly, nothing else, just hydrogens and carbons. So it is a hydrocarbon. We've got this one on the right here. This is something called benzene, really important chemical. Um, this contains a whole load of carbons and a whole load of hydrogens, and again, nothing else. It doesn't matter that in this case, we've got some of these double bonds here. That doesn't stop it being a hydrocarbon because there are still only hydrogens and carbons. Now, some non-examples then. On the left here, we've got carbon dioxide, um, our CO2. Now, this is not a hydrocarbon because although it's got carbon in it, it shouldn't have oxygen. The oxygen disqualifies it from being a hydrocarbon. If these were both H's, then yeah, it would be a hydrocarbon, but they're not, they're oxygens. Um, and on the right here, um, although we've got hydrogen and carbon, which makes it look like a hydrocarbon, it's also got this oxygen there, and that disqualifies it from being a hydrocarbon. So to be a hydrocarbon, you can only contain carbon and hydrogen, but you must have both. Now, hydrocarbons can have different shapes. They can form chains and rings. So this first one, our butane, that's an example of a chain-shaped hydrocarbon. What we mean is that each of our carbons is joined together uh, in sort of one long row or one long chain, as we call it. And they can also be ring-shaped as well. So if we look at the carbons in our benzene, they loop round in one loop of six carbons to form a six-part ring. Okay, so where do we get most of our hydrocarbons from? Well, a major naturally occurring source of hydrocarbons is crude oil, which is, you can see the picture of it here, it is this kind of thick, black, sticky liquid that we pull out from deep underground. Okay, And it is this major source of hydrocarbons. Now, it is not a single hydrocarbon, but it is a complex mixture of hundreds of different hydrocarbons. Okay, And we can use the different hydrocarbons in it for all sorts of things. A major, major use of them is as fuels, which we'll see later in the lesson. But if you uh, have travelled recently in a car or a bus or a plane or a train even, there's a good chance that those would have been powered by hydrocarbon fuels. Um, we can also use them as a feedstock for the petrochemical industry. That means we can think of that word feedstock as sort of ingredient or maybe a reactant. So a lot of different chemicals are made from the hydrocarbons found in uh, crude oil. And we call the industry that does this the petrochemical industry. Um, and all sorts of things from plastics to fertilizers, even the medicines that treat you when you're ill. Many of those things come from the hydrocarbons found in crude oil. Now, importantly, crude oil is a finite resource. Um, that means it will run out because we are using it faster than it is being replenished. Now crude oil is a really valuable substance um, and it's valuable because it's got so many different uses. Um, the trouble is actually when you get out of the ground it's not at all useful because there are just too many different substances in that mixture. So to make the crude oil useful we must separate it into its individual parts first and we call those different parts fractions. So although crude oil itself is not useful each of the individual fractions that we can separate it into are super useful. 
Now, to do this, to separate the crude oil, we use a method called fractional distillation, which you've met before in the separating mixtures uh, unit. And what this does is it separates the fractions by different boiling points, because each fraction has its own different boiling point. And it works something like this. So the first thing we do is we take our crude oil and we heat it until most of it boils. So you can see our crude oil here, okay? And it passes into, into our fractionating column through this pipe that gets heated until the crude oil is about 350 degrees Celsius. Now, nearly all of the different fractions will boil at those high temperatures, okay? Now, as it enters the fractionating column, the fraction with the highest boiling point actually remains liquid, and so it sinks out of the bottom. And so it comes out the bottom there, and that fraction is called bitumen. Now, the gaseous fractions, the ones that have been heated above their boiling points, they will actually rise up the column. And they'll keep on going up the column. And as they move up the column, they'll cool down. And so they'll rise up the column until the point that they get cool enough to condense. And at that point, they're separated out of the column at these different levels. So we've got the substances that condense at the highest uh, temperatures near the bottom, like fuel oil and diesel, and the fractions that condense at the lowest temperatures, so these are the ones with the lowest boiling points, um, come out near the top of the column, like petrol and the gases never actually ever getting cold enough to condense and coming out of the top still as a gas. Now, what about the properties and the uses of the different fractions of our crude oil? So the first thing we need to know for each one is its name. So we start with the gases at the top and then in order we go petrol, kerosene, diesel, fuel oil and then finally bitumen. And you do need to know those names in that order. Now, the first property is to do with the size of the molecules that these things are made from. The gases have the smallest molecules, then petrol is a bit larger, then kerosene is bigger still, then diesel, then fuel oil, and then bitumen has made, is made of the very largest molecules. And just to illustrate the difference in size, the molecules of gases only contain between one and four carbons, while the molecules in bitumen contain over 70 carbons. Now, you don't need to know exactly those numbers, but you do need to know that pattern that the gases have got the smallest molecules, and then as we go all the way down the series through to bitumen, the molecules get larger and larger. Now, the molecule size is important because it determines the boiling points. Now, small molecules have low boiling points, so the gases have the lowest boiling points. That's why they came out of the top of the fractionating column on the previous slide. And as we get further and further and further down our series, the boiling point gets higher and higher because the molecules get larger and larger. And so, for example, the gases, they're boiling at below 30 degrees Celsius. Bitumen won't boil until over 500 degrees Celsius. Again, the numbers aren't important, but that pattern that the boiling point increases and the reason that it's because the molecule size increases, that's the important thing, okay? Now, the boiling point, in turn, affects how easily these things ignite. By ease of ignition, what we're talking about is how easily does it catch fire, okay? Now, you will know from your own experience of lighting a Bunsen burner in the lab that it's very easy to set fire to the gases that come out of crude oil. You know, just one little spark is all it needs. Whereas, um, something like bitumen, you know, roads are made out of, uh, uh, roads are partly surfaced with bitumen, and you don't often see roads catching fire, and that's because bitumen, although it will burn, is very hard to ignite. And the reason why is because it's got a higher boiling point and larger molecules. The last property to think about is viscosity. Viscosity is about how easily something flows. If something's got low viscosity, then it flows very easily. It's kind of thin and runny. And we know that's what gases are like. Again, thinking back to your Bunsen burner, you know how easily the gas flows through the tube from the gas tap into the actual Bunsen burner itself. Okay. Whereas again, something like bitumen is really thick and sticky. You know, you might have experienced how on a very, very hot day, a, ro a new road might get a little bit softer and squishy. 
but for the most part we don't worry about bitumen flowing because it's a very very thick viscous sticky material and so these properties determine the uses of each of our crude oil fractions so the gases they're used for home heating and cooking probably at home you may well have a gas hob to do the cooking you may well have gas fired central heating as well and petrol is used as a fuel generally for cars and motorbikes and other small vehicles and machinery kerosene is used as fuel for aircraft this is literally jet fuel diesel is used as a fuel for vans and lorries and trains and other larger vehicles some cars are also diesel powered but for the most part diesel vehicles tend to be larger heavier vehicles fuel oil is used as fuel for ships you know um, ferries and cruise ships and uh, container ships and those kind of really large boats and then finally we've got bitumen bitumen is used for a couple of things it's used for roofing so if you've got a flat roof um, at home you it, it's probably coated in a sort of a felt material that is soaked in bitumen with sort of uh, little pebbles stuck to the top of it and that's because the bitumen is waterproof so it, it you know it stops water coming through the roof and also it's used for road surfing as well because it's really thick and sticky so it can bind together the stones that are used to surface the road the bitumen is the black part of the tarmac that covers most of our roads okay so homologous series a homologous series is a group of related compounds that differ from each other just by the numbers of CH2s that they contain. Now that will sound a bit strange for now, but we're going to work through an example in a second. So if you're a little bit confused, just bear with it because this is going somewhere. Now, what we find is that many of the hydrocarbons in crude oil are part of the alkanes homologous series, which we're going to meet now. So there are four alkanes that you need to know. You need to know their formulas and their structures. Um, so we're going to go through all of that in just a second. The first one is methane. Now, methane has this formula, CH4, which means that each of its molecules is made of one carbon and four hydrogens. Then we've got ethane, which is C2H6. So each of its molecules is made from two carbons and six hydrogens. We've got propane, C3H8, with molecules made from three carbons and eight hydrogens. And lastly, butane, not butane, made from molecules with the form of C4H10, with four carbons and 10 hydrogens. Now, we said, or I said, that members of a homologous series differ by the numbers of CH2s. And look, every time we go up one uh, from one uh, alkane to the next, we add on one carbon and two hydrogens. So we go from CH4 to C2H6. Then we add on, as we go to the next one, another carbon and two hydrogens. So we go to C3, H8 and then to go to butane we add on another carbon and another two hydrogens and we go from we go from C3H8 to C4H10 so that's what it means by this idea of differing by CH2s every time we go to the next one in the series we add on one more carbon and two more hydrogens now the alkanes have the general formula CnH2n plus 2 what on earth does that mean? Well, let's just have a look at a couple of examples. Um, the N is the number of carbons. So in this case, the number of carbons is 1. So therefore, N equals 1. The number of hydrogens will be 2 times 1, that's N, plus 2, which equals 4. Let's try and do that for um, butane as well down at the bottom. Uh, in butane, the number of carbons is 4. In that case, N equals 4. So the number of hydrogens is 2 times 4, 2N. Add 2, which equals 10. So that's what we mean by that general formula, CnH2n plus 2. Now, um, the hydrocarbons are saturated. Um, this doesn't mean wet in this context. It means that they only contain single uh, bonds. So if we look at their structures, we can see that. So for methane, we've got one carbon in the middle with four single bonded hydrogens around it. For ethane, we've got two carbons in the middle with six single bonded hydrogens 
around them. Okay, so we've got our two carbons there with single bonds, and we've got the six single bonded hydrogens around them. Propane looks like this three carbons in a row with our eight hydrogens arranged all around. A um, couple of things that are worth pointing out still, we've only got single bonds, and note that every carbon in all of these diagrams ends up with four bonds one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So we always have four bonds on every carbon. Butane again, this time we've got our four of our carbons joined together with single bonds, and we've got the um, 10 hydrogens arranged around that, all of those with single bonds and making sure that every carbon has um, four bonds as well. Now, members of a homologous series show a gradual variation in their physical properties and they have similar chemical properties. So the chemical properties bit, that means that they do the same kinds of reactions. So for example, all of these alkanes one of the reactions they all do is that they combust, they burn in oxygen. That's why we use them as fuels. But they've got similar chemical, uh, so physical properties as well. So, for example, if we look at their boiling points, they've all got pretty low boiling points, but we've got this gradual increase in boiling point going from methane down to butane, with the lowest one being methane at minus 162, and butane boiling at zero degrees Celsius. Um, so there's this gradual increase in the boiling point as the molecules get bigger. And similarly, with their density as well, um, you don't need to memorize the numbers, but the general trend is important. Methane starts off with a very low density of 0.72 kilograms per meter cubed, and it gradually increases up to um, butane uh, at 2.48 kilograms per meter cubed. Still a low density, but you can see that there's that gradual increase in that physical property. Now, the last thing I want to talk about um, is the idea of cracking. So what we find uh, is that there's a greater demand than there is supply of the lighter fractions of crude oil. And there's a greater supply than there is a demand of the heavier fractions of crude oil. And we can see that in this graph here. Okay, So the blue bars represent the supply. That's how much of each of the fractions is available in the crude oil. And the red bars represent the demand. That is how much um, of each of those fractions we actually want to be able to use. And what we can see is that with most of the fractions, petrol being the clearest one, there's a much bigger demand than there is a supply. So petrol only makes up about 10% of the fractions in crude oil but it represents about 25% of what we want to use. Whereas, if we look at the fuel oil, there's much, much more uh, fuel oil available than we can use. The supply of it is almost 50%, and we actually only need about 20% of fuel oil. So what can we do? How can we marry up this mismatch between how much of each of the fractions is available in the oil and how much of each of the fractions we want to use for our different purposes. Well, our solution to this is cracking. Now, in cracking, what happens is we convert longer, less useful fractions into shorter, more useful ones. And it works like this diagram here. So what happens is we take hot hydrocarbon vapours and we pass them over an aluminium oxide catalyst. You can see um, so here we've got um, some mineral wool that's been soaked in our hydrocarbon. And here we've got our catalyst being really strongly heated by that Bunsen burner flame. And what that will do is it will cause a longer alkane to break down into a shorter alkane and an alkene. That alkene, we'll look at a bit more on the next page, an alkene is an unsaturated hydrocarbon. So that means it has a double bond. And so this is a really useful process because by cracking, we can take this amount of our fuel oil that we don't really want to use and we can convert it into some of these more useful fractions over here that we've got this greater demand for. OK, so how do we produce equations to describe cracking reactions? Well, the first place to start is with a general word equation to understand the process a bit more. So what happens in cracking is we start with a longer alkane and we make a, make a shorter alkane and a shorter alkene. And that alkene 
is an unsaturated hydrocarbon. That means it contains a carbon-carbon double bond. Now they have this general formula, CnH2n. If we compare that to the general formula for alkanes, which is CnH2n plus 2, it means that alkenes of the same length as an alkane have two less hydrogens. For example, propane, which is C3H6, we can see that, that see the propane up here, and there it's got our three carbons, our six hydrogens, and really importantly, the bit that makes it unsaturated is it's got that carbon-carbon double bond there as well. Now, when we produce a symbol equation for this, the, the way it tends to work is you'll be given two of the substances in the equation and you'll have to work out the formula for the final substance. And we can do that by applying the law of conservation of mass. So let's have a look at a few examples. Now, let's imagine you started with C12H26. It underwent cracking and it produced C8H18 and some other substance. What is that? Well, let's use conservation of mass. If we're starting with 12 carbons, we must be finishing with 12 carbons. So to find the number of carbons in our final substance, we do 12, take away 8, and that tells us that there'll be four carbons in this molecule. And we do similar for the hydrogen. We'll do 26, take away 18. And that tells us there will be eight um, hydrogens in that substance. And that is our equation balanced. It's also worth noting we can tell which one's the alkane and which one's the alkene. This one, N is 4, H is um, uh, the hydrogens is 2 times 4. So that is going to be our alkene because it satisfies CnH2n. And here, if N is 8, 2 times 8 plus 8 is so 2 times 8 plus 2 is 18. So that means that this is our alkane. Okay. Let's look at another one. C20H42 making something and C11H22. Well, let's do the same thing here. The number of carbons in that first substance will be 20. Take away 11 to give us 9 carbons here. And the number of hydrogens will be... Um, oh, will be 42, which I can't write, will be 42, take away 22 to leave us with 20 hydrogens. And there we go, that's conservation of mass being used to solve the equation. And the last one we might have is something like this, where we know both the products. So we know we're making C9H20 and C5H10. So what must our starting uh, molecule have been? Well, we've got nine carbons here, and another five there. So we just add those together to find out that there would have been 14 carbons. And we do the same with the hydrogens. There are 20 here and 10 there. So it would have had 30 hydrogens. There we go. That's it. The end. Um, as always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.